Podcast. I'm Martha DeGrasse, and I'm joined today by Bruce Miller. He is VP of Product Marketing at Xeris. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you. How are you doing, Martha? Great. Thanks for joining us. So Xeris is a Wi-Fi solutions provider, and uh, I'd like to, to start off by hearing a little bit about how you differentiate your solution technically, and then also um, we're going to talk a little bit about your most important vertical, which is the education market. So let's start off with a little bit of an overview of your company, the history, and, and how you differentiate your solution from perhaps Cisco, Aruba, Rucka, some of the other competitors out there. Sure. So uh, Xerus has been around for, uh, for approximately eight years. And uh, what we have done from the start is, and the founder of the company, this goes back to how the company was, uh, was founded, was geared towards really solving the issues of you know, the proliferation of Wi-Fi devices everywhere. I mean, we're, we're basically in the throes of that today. Everybody recognizes that with all the smartphones, tablets, laptops, and, and any other, many other types of devices that are out there. And what we saw back then is that no company was really focused on addressing the anticipated explosion of devices and the usage that we see today. And, and you know, maybe five, eight years ago it wasn't obvious because smartphones weren't, weren't really readily available. But what we saw was that a lot of money was going into developing these devices. So we decided to focus on making an infrastructure that was scalable to support that. So regardless if you were an educational institution or a carrier or a hospital or a public venue such as a football stadium, you know, all of these places have use cases for Wi-Fi that can go into very high density usage and not just lots of people but also, you know, streaming video or moving large files back and forth. Uh, image of files, for example. These are all very stressful and wireless. So our approach has been from the beginning to be able to solve and scale up from regular Wi-Fi support up to very high density, high capacity Wi-Fi. And that's that's what differentiates us is we have a, a unique architecture. Um, we basically took the approach uh, very similar to what uh, the cellular um, you know, mobile operators actually did. Um, if you look at kind of what happened there um, over a period of time when, when cell phones start to explode, they went from making individual stations to consolidating multiple radios and antennas onto onto their base stations because it became very expensive. Every single station could be, you know, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to deploy. So they aggregated those um, resources together and put more radios and put directional antennas. We kind of did the same thing. You can really think of our product as a indoor cell tower for Wi-Fi, and and we make regular APs as well. We make a full product line, but the you know the real point here is that if you need to scale. Um, it's a much, much more efficient way of doing that. Um, you can um, support up to 16 radios, which is the equivalent of eight APs in a single device. You can scale up to thousands of users in, in one device. And so, you know, from, from all the way from very low, low capacity, low coverage to high capacity, all those use cases um, are, are addressed by our product line. And I think that's, uh, you know, a key element of, of what we do. So can you share an example maybe of a customer that did start off very small and then scale to a very large deployment? Um, yeah, so maybe a school would be a good example of that. Um, there's plenty of schools today that have been deploying Wi-Fi um, you know, in their environment for, for many, many years. And um, you know, one, one example of that would be uh, Forsyth, Forsyth County Schools in Georgia. Um, they deployed uh, Azure's wireless network years ago. And then over time, gradually upgraded that uh, that wireless to support greater numbers of users, um, and then turned on a BYOD environment, and all of a sudden had you know three, four times as many users. So, and it was able to handle it because it was anticipating that capacity. Um, so, so this is what we've seen. That's that's uh, you know oftentimes the case in uh, educational institutions is that they they have wireless, they've had it for years, but when they start moving to one-to-one -one programs or they start turning on BYOD um, capabilities in the network. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, the, the usage goes through the roof, and and you know, most wireless networks that are not designed for that well, can't handle that. Um, another example is, um, you know, more at the extreme end of things, we have a customer, a SANS uh, Convention and Expo Center in in Las Vegas, and they have you know two million plus square feet of area that they cover with our products, and they can support tens of thousands of users at one time. For example, the CES show there, Consumer Electronics. So these are the examples of just you know. Uh, you know, in the convention space, very, very large capacities that are that are being able to handle with wireless. Um, not typically the case with with most traditional architectures. To be honest with you, they just don't scale that well. But uh, you need to have some unique and different approaches today to to handle you know tens of thousands of devices. So. 
So you did mention to me before we started that education is your most important vertical. So do you do you find yourself selling to a lot of public school districts? And, and can you talk a little bit about that pro process? Yeah, I mean, edu education is our number one vertical. We certainly sell across a broad range, hospitality, healthcare, um, public venues, as I mentioned, and, and many others as well in the enterprise. Um, but yeah, the, the educational space and, and primary, secondary, um, as well as higher ed, um, they have significant use cases for wireless, you can imagine, just in the ongoing instructional process that, that they go through. Uh, online learning is becoming a much um, more significant uh, element with, with, uh, with education today. There's obviously plenty of content out there. There's Moodle. There's, there's these mechanisms to share content and to uh, you know, do learning in, in, a, in a much more you know, quick uh, fashion, uh, lower cost, you know, replacing textbooks with online materials. There's plenty of, of free material out there that um, you know uh, colleges and and uh, K-12 institutions are using and leveraging on an ongoing basis. And so th this you know there's testing as well, testing initiatives that are being put in place. Uh, for example, Park, uh, which is a recent one that uh, that has uh, come about. And these online uh, capabilities are, are key to really accelerating accelerating the learning process, uh, enabling students with technology to learn uh, more quickly. Um, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to do when you have 30, 40 students in a classroom all firing up at the beginning of class and trying to get to one place or download something and make something happen. And that's where you know, we have seen log jams really come into place is, is that kind of uh, what we call flash traffic instance that happens um, and, you know, with coordinated usage. I would call it coordinated usage of a network as opposed to you know, transactional usage. If you turn on wireless in a you know, wherever, a hotel or, or somewhere, you have people logging on, they're just doing their own thing kind of randomly, but when you have everybody doing the same thing at the same time, that can literally be, you know, 5, 10x the amount of, of, of uh, capacity required. And that's, that's pretty tricky to handle. And this is where, you know, the educational space has really adopted Xerus very strongly because, you know, they have that pain point. They need to address it. They need to make instruction happen if, if they, if, you know, within the first few minutes of class, if the wireless isn't working, you know, the teacher's going to abandon the technology and they'll just go to the whiteboard and, and start using, you know, <laughs> traditional means. They, they, they can't wait and, uh, and, and, and struggle with, with technology actually working. So it's, it's, it's an enabler, but it has to work. So what do you think will happen in Los Angeles this fall when um, all those kids bring their new iPads? I think that Los Angeles School District has a contract with Apple to give um, iPads to most of the kids in the schools. Right, yeah, so that's an interesting one, and we've, we've seen this case play out uh, many times, actually, where, you know, money's made available, um, you know, through grants or bond measures or different facilities to be able to purchase infrastructure uh, or and or the, the, uh, the devices themselves, whether tablets or, or laptops. And, you know, we have customers today that, you know, all of a sudden they deploy 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 or, or whatever it is, number of iPads, and then, uh, oops, you know, hey, did, did the wireless actually you know, get uh, set up accordingly to be able to handle that. So I think in, in this case, you know, depending on the numbers, it, it, it could very well be a, a tricky a transition depending on, on, you know, how that network is deployed. And I don't have, you know, exactly all the details on how their wireless is set up, but, you know, in general, what you have to consider is that, you know, an iPad, depending on what it's being used, um, can pull easily several megabits per second of data if you're doing video, for example, um, even some of the online um, uh, testing use cases, you know, are, are megabit per, more, per second or more. And you start putting 10, 15, 20, 30 of those on in one place, in one classroom, and that can load up an AP and, and, and potentially bring it to its needs. Um, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is that iPads are not the highest end, you know, iPads or tablets in general are not the most robust Wi-Fi um, devices. Um, based on the fact that they're relatively small, they have relatively limited power, they don't have, you know, three antennas like a lot of laptops do. So they don't actually transmit as fast as, as maybe a laptop does, which means they're actually talking slower. And then you try to aggregate all those together, and, and you don't get the overall throughput of the wireless network that you might if you had a lot of laptops. So you have to design the network to handle that. You have to be able to have the capacity and the coverage to ensure that those devices are getting the proper you know, the proper support for the wireless. And, you know, like I said, we, we find out that in many cases that that's not the, the situation with the existing incumbent wireless. So you get a rollout of a large number of devices like that, and you have to start looking at, at uh, a redesign or at least an upgrade to the, to the wireless network.
Right, and I'm, I'm guessing that falls to the IT people in the various school districts. And I'm wondering, are, are you talking with these people? or Are there systems integrators that you work with who then work with the school districts? Or is it the carriers? How does that usually work? Or is it different in every part of the country? Yeah, it, it, or, or just on a case-by-case -case basis. They're, yeah, they're, you're kind of hitting on a lot of those that we certainly work with. I mean, there are certainly MSPs that, that come into play, and that's becoming a more popular approach. Um, there's integrators that work directly with them. We have some customers who like to do it all themselves. You know, some, some districts have that, those facilities. Other folks don't. So it, it, it's really a combination. But I, but I think in general, you know, we work for the most part through a, a reseller network where you have a, a, a value-added um, you know, uh, reseller in the middle that's able to do some of the installation survey design work, for example, and maybe providing other services as well in terms of, you know, cabling or switching or, or other elements of the overall solution, potentially even, you know, the smart boards or things like that. Um, but ultimately, it's, 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 you have to look at everything together as, a, as an overall network solution. Um, you, you can't just buy a bunch of iPads and expect it to work. I mean, you can't just buy those iPads and then buy a bunch of, you know, wireless APs and expect it to work. You have to go deeper in the network and look at your firewalls and your routers and your switches and your uplinks and your internet connection, your internet pipe. Um, you know, we, we find this out a lot of times where we deploy a Zurich Wi-Fi network and we solve the issue at the edge of the network with the wireless device, but the internet pipe is clogged because they're only, you know, whatever, they might have 10 or 20 meg, and it's just not sufficient when you turn on, you know, a BYOD, um, you know, scenario and all of a sudden you have... Uh, you know, 5x the amount of, of traffic uh, on the network. And, um, you know, just one point while I'm thinking about it is, is just within the last month, um, Instagram video was released. And that literally became almost overnight the number one source of video traffic on the Internet, surpassing even YouTube. So it was just amazing how quick um, this actually uh, came into play. And um, it happened, you know, late June, which is actually after most schools end, right? So... What we're thinking, you know, about here is, you know, what, what happens next month in September when all these schools come back into session and you have, you know, students bringing in their, 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 their tablets, their iPods, or what have you. If, if you allow them on the network, you know, there's going to be a lot more traffic because of that video. So it, it's very interesting dynamic um, when, you, when you have these situations that you have to consider, you know, what's running on the network and can I handle it? Um, if the network doesn't work, then all that money is, is you know, um, <laughs> It's kind of put up there in the air, you know, was it, was it worth the investment or was it worth the effort to, to do that? Um, and wireless can be a, you know, a, a tricky consideration if you, don't, if you don't take those design considerations, uh, you know, right from the start. So it sounds like you're saying a lot of schools are generating a lot of network traffic that has little or nothing to do with instruction, just students using their devices as, as they wish, right? Well, yeah, so, so I, I should, yeah, frame that in the context of, of when I say BYOD, there are many schools that we work with that have open policies. So they'll allow their students to come in with whatever they want. And they may restrict the usage during the day to certain apps or certain times or, or what have you. Um, uh, we have other schools who, you know, they don't have that kind of policy, so they pretty well are issuing, say, the, say the iPads in the case of the LUSD or laptops, you know, one-to-one -one programs where they've, they have the devices, but they keep the, the network restricted to those. Um, in the cases, though, where you, you um, have BYOD and you allow the students to bring anything in, or you, you allow them to go to social network sites or, you know, run Instagram or Facebook or what have you, you know, then you're opening up that, that, uh, that element, you know, to the equation. But, you know, we, we believe and we certainly see a lot of school districts have a lot of success doing that. It keeps the students happy. They can communicate. They can actually be dynamic in their instruction and get a lot of value out of that. A lot of schools use Facebook pages to you know, post content and materials and share information with the class. So you don't necessarily want to restrict that. That's how students are and kids are communicating these days. And, and I think it makes sense to adopt and embrace those technologies and incorporate them into the learning environment. And so, you know, the main point here, though, is that you have to do that pragmatically and understand what that impact can be because those tablets, iPo iPads, smartphones, iPods, they don't have an Ethernet connection. They're wireless only, and the only way they're going to work is, is with a good, robust connection. Um, and if, if that's not the case, then uh, you get some pretty frustrated users. Okay. Well, we will need to check back with you in the fall after school starts. Bruce Miller from Xeris, thank you so much for joining us today. Certainly. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. Bye-bye.